Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com runs down the major markets. It was a week of higher highs, higher lows, and higher closes. He also examined some commodities like cocoa and uranium that have done terrifically well. Ross also looks at Bitcoin. President of InsideTrackTrading.com, Eric Haddock, talks about the cycles that appear to affect gold, silver, currencies, and perhaps even cryptocurrencies. He also talks about what he calls a natural year and how that might affect your trading. Author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, John Rubino, digs into interest rates, inflation, stagflation, and why we might be going into happy times for gold bugs and why he's concerned about the strain on U.S. regional banks. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Recyclical, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMY ZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on X at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Always good to be with you, Jim. What happened on the markets this week? Well, let's see. This was another week with higher highs, higher lows, and higher closes. So I think if we start looking from the end of October... Uh, there's only one week in the S&P which actually had a, a lower low uh, in this whole process. So uh, are we overbought? Yes. Have we been overbought for a while? Yes. Um, but, you know, um, it used to be that we talked about just the uh, the NASDAQ and the capitalization-weighted S&P as uh, really being the, the ones on the upside. But as of now, uh, if you take a look at the equal weighted uh, S&P, it's been making new highs the last couple of weeks. The advanced decline line, which had been slow, uh, is uh, moving with the market at this point. So, you know, we're at the tail end of what would be the uh, normally the six-month uh, positive window from uh, the end of October to the end of April. Uh, so, uh, you know, what we watch for is just to see if this thing, how overdone it can get. Uh, the key is that as long as it's making these higher highs and higher lows, you just uh, stick with it. Um, if we start to see an overlap where the the corrections, you know, the, the two or three day corrections, which is what we've been seeing, if they start to overlap any of the resistance levels that you've broken out from, then um, you think that uh, you're in the tail end of the move. So, and and looking at the S and P, I look uh, I look at the twenty and fifty day moving averages, and we've just kissed uh, that twenty day moving average uh, in in January a couple of times, uh, February twice, uh, three times in this uh, uh, recent uh, few weeks. So it's just got slow, regular momentum on the upside. And uh, unless we start to see this thing roll over, um, you don't want to fight the trend. What's going on with gold? Uh, gold, uh, you know, we had that nice spike high. Uh, and uh, for our work, uh, it uh, became a uh, an upside exhaustion point. Uh, as we got into the uh, the 2170 to 2190 range, saw a bit of a consolidation, and there was a spike high uh, this Thursday as uh, Powell's comments uh, from the Fed uh, caused a bit of a spurt there. Uh, we got up over 2200 very momentarily on Thursday, couldn't hold that, and we're back at 2165 at the end of the week. Still thinking that uh, the support here 
should be more uh, in the 2120 range, um, and uh, we'll see how it holds when it gets down in there. Uh, silver continues to uh, have difficulty uh, breaking out on the upside. $26 is sort of the magic number, and we got up there this week and kissed it but couldn't get through. Uh, that really is the number that uh, we're going to be taking a look at. And, uh, you know, when you look at the, the miners, um, they're, they had a little bit of buoyancy during the week, but uh, still um, nothing to speak of uh, in terms of major moves on the upside there. So uh, patience, uh, I think, uh, will eventually be rewarded, but uh, uh, not for this month. What's going on in the crude market? Uh, crude oil, uh, so we got that uh, really nice basing action in December, got the retest of the support in January, uh, just now the, and uh, we've been slowly, slowly just walking our way up here for the last number of weeks. Um, this style of base and turn, if you look back over the last 20 or 30 years, there's maybe um, six to ten examples that are similar to this. And uh, you would expect that the seasonal uh, could carry us uh, uh, longer on the upside right now. The key, uh, when I look back on these other ones, is that it, uh, the oil market didn't run to uh, at least its intermediate high until we got uh, a weekly sequential sell signal. So that will be nine consecutive weeks with closes above four weeks earlier. Now, depending upon whether you're looking at the nearest futures or one of the specific contracts like the, the April or May contract, um, we're only at a count of four or five weeks right now. So there's still lots of potential as far as the oil market is concerned on the upside. Gasoline, uh, which is the strong one um, in terms of the seasonal, is just making an excellent move here. And um, there don't, doesn't seem to be anything there to stopping it. Um, and when you look at the um, uh, oil-related stocks like the XLE or in Canada the XEG, those ETFs, uh, they're just stair-stepping up really, really nicely. So you want to stick with those, uh, you know, stay with what's working. And uh, the oil complex, uh, you know, was uh, slow getting off the ground compared to, you know, the general equity market. Uh, but clearly at this point uh, it is performing uh, very, very nicely. And with gasoline, don't forget, we haven't had the annual explosion or fire at a refinery as they change from winter to summer gasoline. Oh, let's hope not. You know, let's just hope that things <laughs> this year are, are uh, a lot smoother in terms of transitions as far as that's concerned. Maybe not have Boeing do your maintenance. Uh, yeah. <laughs> What's going on with the U.S. and Canadian dollars? Uh, U.S. dollar made a nice turn this week. Um, you know, it's been doing nothing. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, you know, starting to break out of, well, trying to break out of the trading range. We're up at 104 and change on the index. It had been down to 102 and a half, but uh, there's still pretty significant overhead resistance just shy of 105. But uh, after uh, the comments from uh, Chairman Powell, uh, the dollar made a good turn on the upside on Thursday, some follow-through on Friday, but uh, we really need to see it push through that 105 to say that there's uh, there's much going on there. Uh, you On the uh, Canadian dollar, um, it's uh, doing the inverse of that. We close at 73.45, which then is the lowest low actually the lowest close that we've seen since December. So this one's looking heavy at this point. And, uh, you know, the trend in the Canadian, uh, when it's down and the oil market's up, that's not good. You want to see Canadian uh, participating as a commodity currency on the upside. You know, and when we take a look at other uh, commodities other than oil to look at, to compare it with, we're seeing nice bottoms uh, as far as the uh, the grains are concerned. Corn, wheat, soybeans, all coming off uh, pretty good lows. And uh, the commitment of traders numbers that we look at uh, gave some really good buy signals here in the last couple of weeks uh, as far as uh, corn and soybeans were concerned. And we're starting to see that move off the bottom. 
Uh, this week's numbers are still uh, constructive as far as those two are concerned. Um, and the other commodity uh, of note had been uh, cotton, which broke out of that nice uh, base and uh, had a pretty good run, got the uh, speculators, I think, a little too excited on the upside. So a commitment of traders numbers um, gives us a sell signal two weeks ago, and we're starting to see a good pullback in there. We had been up to 103. Uh, we're back to 92 at this point now. I would think anything under 92 in terms of the cotton market uh, would be uh, worth taking a look at um, on the long side. And our anything else file today is overflowing. I'll bet it is. You know, what have we got? Cocoa. Here we are. We've been, so, you know, a month ago we talked about cocoa having a big run and getting ahead of itself. Well, cocoa has now doubled since January. Um, gosh, uh, conditions in uh, the West uh, Africa are not good. And uh, look at just uh, what's going on here. The, we talked about being at all-time highs a month ago in terms of cocoa price as well. You know, I was in the store today, and uh, I, I could see the uh, the results here. Uh, that uh, chocolate bar was much, much smaller, and I really said to myself, I can eat that now because I'm not going to put on as many cal- uh, take as many cal- <laughs> calories. <laughs> oh. Um, other markets that are moving, uh, you know, the Bitcoin uh, had that big exhaustion high up at 73000 for us um, and pulled back into the low 60s. Still, um, 60000 would be a pretty attractive level to take a look at that as a buy. Um, uranium, there's that other one that uh, had the big run, uh, got up to 106 uh, with exhaustion highs. Uh, we now have corrected back to 83, so that's percentage-wise. You know, you're talking at uh, better than a 20% decline in price off the high, and it's uh, now uh, looking like it's basing here and going to be set up for uh, its next run on the upside. So, you know, when we look around, there's a lot of things happening in the commodities and in the equity markets right now. Ross, thank you so much for the update. Pleasure to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Find him on X at Charts by Ross. Coming up, Eric Haddock, next on This Week in Money. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Eric Haddock, CEO and President of InsideTrackTrading.com. He's speaking to us from Central California. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Eric, can you tell us a bit about InsideTrackTrading.com and why you have two eyes inside, inside? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the reason for that is it's an acronym that describes the uh, primary markets or arena of markets that uh, we focus on. Uh, It dates back to the beginning of the business about 30 years ago, uh, and and it stood for... uh, the, the IN stood for inflation markets, uh, basically most of the commodities. SI stood for stock indexes. Second I stood for interest rates. D was for dollar and currencies. E was for energy markets. But it has uh, expanded since then. We've obviously stuck with the name. But we provide uh, analysis, trend analysis, price analysis, cyclic analysis, and trading strategies for uh for many of the financial markets and commodity markets and providing different subscriber-based uh, publications. Now, we saw the price of gold set a new all-time high this week. Do you have time or price targets for gold? Yes, I definitely have both of those. And ever since we published the most recent uh, buy signal, 
uh, right around mid-February, gold has been projected to first see a rise, a quick sharp rally into uh, March 6th to the 8th with an initial upside target at 2170 to 2200. It uh, it ran up into the 8th and, and spiked above 2200 at the time. But along with that, those buy signals, there were also more intermediate and, and multi-month upside targets. There are actually a few upside uh, cycle timeframes that are in focus for gold. The second one was for a, another rally into the, uh, the end of March which ties into a consistent uh, seven-month cycle that has been uh, influencing gold for the last few years. This is actually the midpoint of that cycle, but you often see corroborating peaks during those mid-cycle time frames. And so that was that is the, the second um, time frame that I'm looking for as far as a uh, a higher peak at that time by the end of March. And then looking out into middle part of the year is when a much greater convergence of cycles comes together. And that's when I think we'll see a much more significant peak in gold. But on in the near term, we just uh, started out the week with a spike down around 2150 that reinforced some of the secondary upside targets we have. And just overnight, we spiked up to about 22 and a quarter. And so gold's trying to break out again above the early March highs and need to close above them to trigger the next upside objectives. Silver's been showing some strength. What do you see ahead for silver? Silver has certainly been lagging gold, but I think we're definitely in that what I've called the sweet spot for silver and for gold, but particularly for silver because of its not only precious, but industrial aspect, industrial metal aspect, and all the different uh, uses that that has, as well as a safe haven type of investment. Uh, and I think that we're in that time frame when you have you still have a lot of inflationary underpinnings to the market that are there to support markets like silver, but you are removing one of the biggest impediments that it has had up to this point, and that has been the threat of higher interest rates on the horizon. And so you've kind of had these competing forces, one trying to prop up silver, the inflationary aspects and some of the other demand factors that are coming into play. But at the same time, it keeps running up against a, a ceiling created by that threat of higher interest rates for the last couple of years. But now with the removal of that threat, you are opening up the opportunity for silver to start breaking out higher. So I do think that it has some pretty um, good upside potential leading into its next cycle peak a few months from now. What is the so-called sweet spot for gold and silver? Well, that's what I was saying. Is it, It's where you've got the, the inflationary pressures still there, very prevalent in the market, even though they aren't, even though inflation isn't rising at the same rate that it may have been, but they're continuing to provide a positive influence, whereas uh, the, the threat of and the uh, burden of higher interest rates is mo removed. And so you get that time frame where all of a sudden the, the positive influences greatly outweigh the negative ones and give you that sweet spot where it's, it's much more beneficial for up moves in gold and silver. Stock markets broke out to new highs this week. Do you have time or price targets for the stock markets? Well, you've got some of the indexes breaking out, like you said. Others are still struggling to exceed their December, January, and February highs, depending on which index and which stock you're looking at. And this is the type of divergent topping process that I expected to see in here. 
And a couple of these indexes have spiked to new highs, even a little beyond when I thought the majority of equity markets would peak. So I think we're getting very close to a top and will likely enter a at least a one to two month period where we'll see uh, a bit more selling in the markets and those highs hold for a little bit longer than they have. The U.S. dollar continues to be in a trading range. Could gold in the stock markets move higher with a stable U.S. dollar? And does this fit in with your cycle of currency wars? Um, you could certainly see gold and the stock markets move higher. Uh, a lot of times with these various intermarket correlations, whether they be uh in, in tandem, whereas, you know, when you see one market move up, you see another market move up, or whether that's an inverse correlation, which is often assumed in something like the dollar and gold. If dollar's heading higher, gold should be heading lower and vice versa. That's not always the case. And most of those correlations really only have a strong impact or influence when whatever the lead market is in that particular correlation is in an accelerated type of move. So when you get something like the dollar just kind of trading sideways, it allows those other markets, in this case, you mentioned gold and stock market, it allows them to trade on their other forces and fundamentals and not really be paying much attention to the value of the dollar. If the dollar was really surging, like it did a couple of years ago, that you know, really kept a weight on gold. But now that you've got the dollar just stabilizing, gold has other influences and other factors that are propping it up. So the dollar's not really having much effect on that. So yes, to answer your question, you you could see that. Um, but I think there are a lot of other factors coming into play in the dollar where we could actually see some more downside later this year, and that could have an interesting impact on a lot of these markets. Uh, as for the cycle of currency wars that I often talk about, that does fit right into that whole scenario, and that's something I've described on a very broad, longer-term base, is a recurring 40-year cycle where on uh, that basis, about every 40 years, you get this renewed conflict between uh, paper or fiat currency and hard currency or metals. Uh, more recently, you also have digital currency entering into that fray. But I do think that we are, I described how the next phase of that currency war should start in 2022. And that's exactly when we saw the dollar peak gold bottom, Bitcoin bottom, and you've started the new phase of that battle. And I think that that's going to last into the the first phase of it, last into at least 2025 or 2026. And that could see some significant downside in the dollar index and uh, periods of time where anti-dollar instruments like gold, like Bitcoin, uh, will have some strong moves up. So it definitely reinforces that currency war scenario that I've been talking about. What's the latest on your 17-year cycle? I'm really watching that cycle closely because the most consistent or most uh, salient application of that cycle is right where we are now in 2024, 2025. And I have shown where it has linked to everything from stock market declines, uh, Middle East conflict. It also has a close correlation to real estate prices and peaks. And the the latest 17-year cycle in that arena came into play in late 2023, uh, as far as the one I just mentioned about stock market and coinciding uh, Middle East conflict. That is... Uh, coming into play in 2024, 2025, and you can link it back to similar events where the stock market's concerned in 2007, 2008, and where the Middle East wars are also along with that. 
back in 1990, you had both. In 1973, you had both. 1956, you had both. 1939, you had both, where you saw very serious corrections in the stock market and you saw conflict in the Middle East. Uh, and, and that has been the time frame where something like oil has been such a major part of our economy and and everything from inflation to geopolitics as well. But there are other factors of that 17-year cycle that I've talked about that are also pointing to this current time frame. Even the, even the dollar is linked to that. And its its last major low in 2008 is pointing to 2025, possibly stretching into 26 as the next significant low. But that would mean we'd obviously have a, a decline leading into that. There's also what I've found a pretty close correlation to uh, strong recessions that I'm going to be discussing in my uh, next Inside Track monthly newsletter, but that also is uh, a harbinger of something we could see in the coming years. So the 17-year cycle is very much alive and well, and I think it's going to play a growing influence in the markets over the next couple of years. In recent publications, you again discussed the natural year. What is the natural year, and why is it important now? Well, very simply, it's it's the year that is more solar based and is a year that has been adhered to in agrarian agriculture based societies for thousands of years. And it begins with the vernal equinox, which we just passed through in the last couple of days. And so we have begun a new natural year and many markets adhere fairly closely to that and give you a strong indication of what they're going to be doing throughout each annual period by what they do in the first couple weeks of that natural year. And I was even discussing in, uh, in stock indexes that we've had that type of correlation over the last few years where there have been uh, significant moves that took place right in the opening uh, weeks of each natural year and ended up having a, a strong impact on what followed. Uh, for example, in, in March of 2020, uh, the natural year began with the major bottom in the stock market. Stocks had sold off sharply. And various indexes bottomed between March 16th and March 23rd of 2020, and then began an entire new bull market. Uh, in March of 2021, the shift of the natural year uh, began a whole new stock market advance, and the low that was set during that opening period held for almost 15 months. Uh, fast forward a year from there, March of 2022, you had, it was a secondary peak, but a very significant peak that held for over a year and, and triggered um, the, the next and more significant sell-off in the stock market. Uh, then in March of 2023, we started an, another new advance in the stock market that has continued until right now, the beginning of natural year 2024. So you have this consistent if you're watching and and observing what goes on you have you have a lot of significant transitions and trend reversals that happen right around that time frame and that even fits with what I was discussing about uh, gold a few minutes ago where I think we could see it uh, see a final surge into a a multi-week maybe even a one to two month peak in the into the end of March. And so it's a it's something to watch very closely. It's also something that continues to have an impact on many agricultural markets for obvious reasons. Uh, even in the grain markets, you're you're getting into the time when carryover stocks are at their lowest and when planting start to begin. And so it it has a a big impact 
by observing what happens in those few weeks, you get some really important clues as to what to expect in the ensuing months. Is there a cycle that controls or is, uh, I don't know, influential when it comes to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? Uh, because they've been around so uh, in, for such a limited amount of time, I, I think you can only look at weekly and monthly cycles. I have discussed uh, a, a four-year cycle that what appears to be pretty consistent in Bitcoin. It was something I wrote about back in third quarter of 2021 and explained why November, December of 2021 should be a um, a one to two year top and, and create a, a bubble bursting is what I described back then. But that had been uh, as consistent of a cycle going back to the the origin of Bitcoin in 2009 and then uh, significant turning points in late 2013, late 2017. I think that you'll see the next important peak in Bitcoin towards the end of 2025. And that also fits with the dollar analysis that I was just discussing about and some of my uh, outlook for gold and silver. So there are some cycles that are becoming evident, and there are certain monthly cycles that have been more consistent. Uh, one of those has been a cycle that's prevalent in many markets, kind of a seasonal or a 90-day, three-month type of cycle uh, which was part of the reason I thought we would see a strong surge from mid-December, the last significant low, into mid-March, and we've since completed that. So there are different cycles that are fairly reliable, but I always look for price action to be the ultimate determining factor and, and filter for any of those cycles. Are there cycles that affect interest rates? And if there are, we're in a very confusing time because the Bank of Canada, England, and the Fed all held their rates the same. The Bank of Japan just hiked their rate for the very first time in 17 years to a whopping 0 to 0.1%. Meanwhile, Turkey is up 500 basis points to 50%, but the Swiss Central Bank dropped their rate 0.25%. Is it a very confusing thing to try to have a cycle? Well, I don't think that you can uh, assume that every global economy is on the same uh, interval, same cycle, same uh, periodicity as, as all of the others. And it's interesting you bring up the Bank of Japan because for the last six months or so, I've been writing about that same 17-year cycle in the uh, in the Nikkei, and and why I thought that that index should continue to rally into the first quarter of 2024, right now, and and potentially set a very significant peak right now. So it. It makes a lot, of, and it has done that. In fact, it just recently um, attacked and, and spiked a high uh, above the high that it set in late 1989, late uh, early 1990. Uh, this is the first time it has returned to that level uh, 34 years later, which is two of those 17-year cycles. And so, you know, they're on a whole different um, sequence of economic swings. So for them to be raising interest rates right now certainly uh, dovetails with that and corroborates that, whereas many of your other Western economies are, you know, a, a few years into inflationary cycles and finally holding interest rates pat. So it's it's more a case of not trying to lump too many things into one cycle without seeing how those cycles are impacting each one differently. It's kind of like I talk about when someone's trying to ask me why this market isn't following a correlated market. My response is always the same. You have to analyze each market on its own. Then, you know, if you see a lot of coinciding cycles, factors, uh, indicators of, of extreme uh, trend or whatever, 
that then you might look for the correlation. But until then, you need to treat each market on its own, just like you need to treat each of those economies and each of their respective cycles on their own and not try to lump them all together. Where are we in the crude oil cycle? Crude has been uh, rallying pretty nicely from uh, its its late 2023 secondary lows. And I've been looking for a an initial peak here in late March. But depending on the price action of the next two to three weeks, that's going to hopefully reveal to me whether I think crude has a another leg up into mid-year, but it's definitely showing me that it's closer to a peak in a, in a longer-term cycle than, than any low. And there are some corresponding uh, inflation indexes, like the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, that is heavily weighted in energy markets, so it's going to move similar to crude. And my analysis in that has shown that uh, we're in the midst of an intermediate rebound, but that it could have one final low in around July of 2024. So it wouldn't surprise me to see crude, uh, once it does set a, a peak, uh, to then see some selling into, into at least July. But it's really in the midst of a, a much broader trading range right now. And I, I still expect the, uh, the 2023 highs to hold for uh, quite a bit longer. Eric, where can our listeners get more information on Inside Track and the weekly relay? They can find all of that information and a lot of archived samples and reports at our main website, insidestracktrading.com. And that is inside, spelled with the extra I in the middle. So it's I-N-S-I-I-D-E, tracktrading.com. Eric, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thanks for having me back, Jim. My guest has been Eric Haddock, CEO and president of InsideTrackTrading.com. Coming up, John Rubino, next on This Week in Money. Recyclical, making lithium-ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium-ion last forever. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble. He founded the website DollarCollapse.com. You can find him on Substack at Rubino.Substack.com. Welcome back to the show, John. Hey, Jim. Good to be back. John, this week the Fed kept the Fed rate unchanged at 5.5%. A lot of people are predicting lower rates this year, including the Fed. Is inflation the elephant in the room that could throw a big wrench into their plans? Um, yes and no. Uh, the, the Fed did kind of sort of begin to capitulate here where they're, um, you know, now they're getting kind of specific where they're talking about three cuts in the year ahead. And, um, you know, they're not as coy as they were. Uh, and they're doing that in the face of some inflation measure, measures that are way above their target. The uh, The services part of the consumer price index is rising at about 8% a year, uh, which, you know, that's a crisis level inflation rate, which would normally lead the Fed to have to raise interest rates. But uh, they, they're seeing so many other things that are really scaring them. And that's why they're talking about 
uh, cutting interest rates right now. First of all, you know, the, com- the uh, commercial real estate sector is tanking, um, credit card debt and the interest on that debt is soaring and the, the interest on the government debt is going straight up. And there's a bunch of other things like that where they're, um, you know, one level down below the headlines. So everybody doesn't necessarily know about them, but the Fed knows and they know that, um, that, They've got some big problems coming unless they cut rates, even if inflation is high. So what we're looking at very possibly is stagflation now where um, interest rates start coming down and inflation either stays where it is now, which is modestly high or goes up. And the economy still doesn't grow because interest rates, even though they're down a bit, are still high enough to choke off a lot of economic activity through higher interest rates. So, yeah, we, we could be looking at a replay of the 1970s only with vastly more financial fragility out there. Uh, and uh, I, I think the 1970s, a replay of that would be the best case scenario that we can hope for. And I think what's going to actually come will be vastly worse than that decade. Back in the 70s, I was fortunate enough to work for broadcasting chains that actually gave their employees cost of living bonuses every three months there'd be an extra 130 dollars on my paycheck i don't see anybody doing that now well see that's how inflation gets embedded in a society it picks up for a while and then everybody demands a cost of living clause in their contract and then every time you know there's a little bit of inflation wages go up and that wage inflation pulls up overall inflation and so on until you uh, you have this nightmare scenario where there's nothing you can do um, short of what we did back in the 1970s and early 80s. We raised interest rates to 20 <laughs> percent. So that's how they broke the back of inflation slash stagflation back then. But we can't do that now because 20 percent interest rates would destroy everybody. It would be uh, um, it, it would be like a, a neutron bomb went off on the fi- in the financial sectors of every major country. And so we can't do it. So we don't have the tools that you would need to fix the problems that we're creating. So my prediction is chaos. No specific thing, but just chaos from from um, shore to shore in every country. Yeah, well, in, in Canada in the 70s, you couldn't buy groceries with a credit card. You couldn't buy liquor with a credit card. Now you can buy anything with a credit card. That's charging you, if you're at Walmart, 29.9% interest. Well, that's what people are doing in the U.S. I don't know how it's working in Canada for you. Oh, it's worse. We have higher household debt. (laughs) Okay. Because, you know, a lot of people just can't pay their bills with what they're earning. So they're putting their day-to-day lives on credit cards here, which means they're they're paying that that rate you just mentioned. uh, You know, between 20 and and 30% is where the credit card rates are now. Um, So we're seeing the personal interest expense start to soar in the U.S. And, you know, it's going up parabolically, which means it's just going to eat whatever wage increases anybody gets going forward um, and bankrupt a growing number of people. That's part of the chaos I was talking about. You know, whole sectors of the economy just going bust, you know, and defaulting on all their debts. And that, that's one thing out of many that is coming, almost certainly. Uh, a secret RCMP report unveiled by the National Post uh, newspaper after a Canadian professor, Matt Malone, a law professor, assistant law professor at the B.C. Thompson Rivers University, had put in a Freedom of Information request, and he got this highly redacted report from the RCMP warning politicians and police forces to expect civil unrest as Canadians start to realize how poor they are. In Vancouver, people can't afford to spend twenty-five to three thousand dollars a month on a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, so even if you have a job, you can't afford to live. They're living in their cars or on the street. But as more and more people get into that situation, there there's going to be riots. Well, yeah. I mean, we've stolen the lives of um, of people aged twenty to fifty, at least in the U.S. You know, baby boomers. We've sucked up all the wealth. And we haven't left anything for everybody else because of inflation. You know, the generation that owns the houses and the stocks and the bonds makes money when an inflationary boom gets going. And so um, boomers, we just, you know, sat in our McMansions and got richer and richer. Mm-hmm. And now the millennials and the Gen Xers, I think that's the two generations that are behind us, are, um, you know, they're 
broke and frustrated. They can't live normal lives because they can't buy houses. I guess it's the same thing in Canada where you guys had a housing bubble that dwarfs even our housing bubble down here. And we had a historically big housing bubble that's still going. Mm. So, yes, um, people in that kind of a situation, they take to the streets. They want back what was stolen from them. Uh, and one, one problem that uh, you guys have is that they already took away all your guns. So I think you should start smuggling um, AR-15s. Oh, and, uh, believe me, they are. Six hour, nine mils. Uh, yeah, okay, but right good. now... You should the, get as many as you can in preparation. I was going to say, they're already smuggling the gang. All the gangs have machine guns and stuff now in Canada. There's video good. of them machine gunning people. So the but bad guys need, have them, know, and the good people don't have anything. Well, but the regular Canadians have need, need to be stockpiling guns for the civil unrest that's coming. Otherwise, they'll just tear gas you and cart you off to prison for hate speech, and you won't have done any good. So you need to be able to make a serious point and be noticed, and you're going to need a lot of guns for that. So, America, we're happy to ship a bunch up to you, so just let us know. Hmm. Gold broke out to new all-time highs this week. Could this be the breakout the gold bugs have been waiting for? And by the way, what we just said talked about, John, we could be hauled away with the hate speech law. Yeah. They'll put yeah, out an extradition well, treaty true. for you. Oh, well, you know what? I, I did all the talking just now, and you didn't actually agree to any of that stuff with the guns, so I think you're okay. <laughs> and they, I, I, I'm just not going to go to Canada for a while until this blows over. This. Well, not okay, in the next gold. five years anyway, according to that report. <laughs> Gold broke out to new all-time highs, so th could this be the breakout the gold bugs have been waiting for? Well, maybe in general, yeah. Cause, I mean, there, there are two or three ways of looking at gold. One is that sh it should already be five to $10,000 an ounce. So if it goes up into the 2000s, that's just what should be happening. And we, we really don't even need to look for the, uh, the catalyst. It just should already be that high. Um, and it's going to be much higher. But uh, if we want to look at what's, what's happening right now, there's two or three things. One is what we just talked about. The Fed is capitulating and we're liable to get stagflation because they're, they're not squeezing inflation out of the system and they're giving up too early. Uh, that's one thing. Another is that the world's central banks, which used to be big net sellers of gold, have switched and now they're big net buyers to, to the tune of like um, a thousand tons of gold a year for the last two years in a market where uh, the mines of the world only produce um, 4,000 tons. You know, so that's 25% of mine production just being taken off the market by these new whales in the gold market and other things being equal, that'll give you a higher price too. So, so we got those two things going right now. Uh, and then the last is kind of related to the, the central bank buying is and that's the BRICS countries are still making noises about bypassing the dollar and uh, they're, they're doing it in bilateral trade and you know to the extent that they keep finding ways to do that um, the dollar's necessity uh, in global trade will diminish um, alongside uh, BRICS growth uh, and that also makes gold more attractive so so you got a lot of reasons to like gold right now now on, on the downside there's seasonality um, we're getting close to the sell in May and go away part of the season that always catches me off guard. You know, I'm, I'm almost always uh, in April all excited because of what happened in the last three or four months. And I'm buying gold and silver miners and stuff like that just in time for four really boring months starting in uh, April or May or June and just running until winter. Um, so, eh, you know. I, I wouldn't be betting the farm on gold right now just because of seasonality, uh, but I would be dollar cost averaging into the the coins that you like, the bars that you like, and the mining stocks that you like. Just don't don't jump with both feet, but continue to add to your positions. And if it corrects in the next few months, then you just get what you wanted to buy cheaper. Silver is also showing strength with their all-time high around $50 an ounce. Again, that was during the 70s. Any predictions for silver? Well, silver got to uh, almost 50 bucks an ounce in 2011, I think. So it, it happened. it's happened twice in our more or less adult lifetimes. Uh, once in 1980, once in uh, 2011. And there's, uh, again, the same thing. Um, as with gold, silver ought to be 50 bucks an ounce to 100 bucks an ounce right now. So if it goes up from here, it's just doing what it should have done all along. Uh, but the silver story is different from gold's, although it's related, but in some ways more interesting. Silver is an industrial metal 
that's already in really extreme demand. Just from industrial uses, there's a shortage of or a deficit between what the mines are producing and what uh, solar panels and electric cars and chip makers are buying right now. So let that continue, then all the available gold gets soaked up, it's gone, and prices have to adjust to the imbalance between supply and demand. And demand is going to continue to grow. And supply is really not, you know, there, there just aren't that many primary silver mines. And a, a, a lot of the silver that's produced is a, as a byproduct for other kinds of mining. And other kinds of mining is having a tough time of it. You know, and Jim, you probably, uh, uh, or your listeners are probably familiar with what's with what's happening in the copper market, where Panama just closed one of the biggest copper mines in the world. And other mines are threatened by various kinds of geopolitical issues. So, you know, we, we may not get as much base metal mining as we thought, which means maybe not as much silver will be produced as, as we expected. And the, um, the deficit will either remain what it is today or grow from here. And the prices have to go up. So that's the um, industrial metal part of the silver story. And then it's, you know, it's gold's little brother. It trades in a range with gold. So let gold go to 5,000 and silver goes to, or the silver gold ratio goes to 40 down from today's 80. And you got $100 silver. Very easy. So I expect that to happen in the next few years. Isn't Mexico talking about buy, uh, banning open pit mines? And wouldn't that be yeah, a well, major source of silver being removed? Yeah, the, the president of Mexico actually proposed that. And uh, yes, Mexico is a huge silver producer. So um, banning, it's got other resources too. There's a lot of mining that happens in Mexico. And banning open pit mining would, um, well, shut down or force extremely big changes in mining practices at a lot of places. So yeah, that that would, at least in the short run, dramatically um, lower the amount of mining output in Mexico. And Mexico is one of the biggest uh, mining countries in the world. So yeah, yeah. So there's all kinds of stuff like that happening. And then you got the US and Russia where the US really wants to steal Russia's natural resources. So we're trying to engineer a war. Um, and were that to happen, then a bunch of Russia's natural, resor natural resources would go off the market for a while. So yeah, um, I, I think there's an excellent chance that the silver shortage or silver deficit turns into a fairly extreme shortage in the not too distant future and then that sends prices through the roof from here gold and silver certificates versus holding actual physical gold and silver what are you in favor of well i think if you're getting into commodities you start with physical so if you like gold and silver then you want to buy as absolutely as much physical gold and silver as you can safely store OK, because you, you got to be able to keep it and protect it once yeah. you buy it. But when when you when you've stacked to the point where you're satisfied with your physical, then you start looking at other variations on the gold and silver theme. You know, some of the mining stocks are, are going to do great. And the physical ETFs are see the physical ETFs are really interesting because they don't have any kind of um, um mining risk, right? They just buy a bunch of gold or silver or uranium or whatever, put it in a vault or wherever you store uranium, and uh, and then just ride the price of that stuff up. And so all these mining problems that we're talking about, they actually help the physical commodity ETFs by um, taking more supply off the market through various kinds of turmoil, raising the price of those commodities because supply is smaller. And so the fiscal ETFs just sit there and watch their value go up. Um, another kind of, you know, paper, gold and silver that is partially insulated from mining problems um, is the royalty slash streaming companies. Because what they do, they, they go around and they finance mine, um, mine development. And in return for helping to get a mine started, they take a cut of what that mine produces. But, and, and you know, any individual mine can run into trouble, but the, the big um, royalty companies might have 400 different deals like that spread all over around the world. So they're not as vulnerable to um, the geopolitical issues that are happening with the mining industry. They're, they're slightly volatile or um, vulnerable, but not nearly as vulnerable as an individual mining company that has, you know, three or four mines. If they lose one, they're in big trouble. Uh, so get physical first, then 
take a look at the um, fiscal ETFs and then take a look at the royalty companies. And that's the, the progression through the um, the precious metal space. Stock markets also hitting new all time highs. There are a lot of stock market bears out there, though. What are your thoughts on the stock markets going forward? Well, the U.S. stock market in particular looks just like the uh, dot-com bubble era stock market. So if history repeats, we've got a, a monstrous crash coming pretty soon. Um, and uh, on the other hand, if we're going to continue to run insane deficits like we are in the U.S., which is very stimulative, and the Fed is going to start cutting interest rates, we're liable to get um, inflation recovering. And some of that extra money that the government is creating out of thin air will flow into stocks. And that, that might elevate stock markets from here. So so we've got two things. We've got valuation, which is screaming crash. And we've got monetary and fiscal policy, which is, is screaming excess liquidity. And uh, one of those two things is going to end up being right. And we just have to see. But I think at some point, without a doubt, there is the the mother of all short sale opportunities out there in U.S. equities. So it's just a question of timing well, because you don't want to be there short before the final doubling. Right. So you want to want to be there towards the end of the final doubling. Uh, and that's the intellectual challenge. How are we going to figure out where this thing rolls over? And I think um, I think. One thing we might want to look for is some kind of a crisis out there. Like right right now, people are talking about um, um, commercial real estate, in other words, office buildings starting to go bust, and that impacting the local and regional banks who start to go bust and then force the U.S. government to come in and bail them out. If we have a banking crisis, that could easily produce an overall equities bear market because it'll scare everybody so much. So once the banks start getting into trouble, that's probably a good time to nibble at some, for instance, long-term put options on the, the NASDAQ or the S&P 500. I know I will do that. You know, as soon as the, a few more bank headlines start happening, um, I will definitely buy some more shorts on the overall market. Um, and we'll see if that's the, the time when it was right to do it. But it's, it's one signal that it might be the time. The U.S. dollar seems to be relatively stable as gold and stock markets are hitting new all-time highs. What's going on? Well, if gold is going up, the dollar, by definition, is weak, right? Because the only rational way to measure the dollar, well, there are two ways. One is its purchasing power. What can you buy with it? And that's down by 35 or 40% in the last four or five years. Uh, the other is versus real money like gold, where uh, the dollar is down dramatically because gold is up in dollars. So you know, the dollar has not been stable. Uh, we had a big burst of inflation. The cost of living is uh, is much higher now than it was a few years ago in the U.S., which is the same thing as saying the dollar is much weaker. And, um, you know, back when uh, when gold was $1,500 an ounce, and now it's $2,200 an ounce almost. And so that is basically the decline of the dollar during that period. Uh, I don't think there's really any end I mean, it'll be choppy, but I think the dollar's long-term trend in terms of purchasing power and versus real money is down. And, you know, there's no way to know, no way to predict what's going to happen in the next six months or the next month or anything. But um, intermediate term and longer term, what we've seen in the last few years with the dollar could easily be replicated um, and only on a bigger scale, more in a more disorderly way. Uh, that terrifies everybody. So that's that's part of our future that I think is pretty much baked in the cake. Do the lithium and battery metal stocks look like they could go for a run with many new gigafactories and even Terra factories announced? And the question, will there be enough lithium and other battery metal supplies available for all these new giant factories? I'm going to go out on a limb and say that um, the electric car market is imploding at the moment. <laughs> if you look at the, uh, the resale prices of Teslas and other kinds of um, electric cars, um, they're, they're down hard. They're not holding their value as, uh, as well as internal combustion engine cars. And because of that, the sales of electric cars in the U.S. Uh, are not what they were expected to be. And if, if it turns out that battery-driven electric cars are not going to take over, which I think it's obvious now that they're not, and that we might have to wait for fuel cell driven 
electric cars to take over, which that's a few years away, um, then, you know, I, I wouldn't be overexcited about battery metals right now just because the, the thing they go into is not doing nearly as well as expected. But um, the, uh, the fuel cell thing is a great part of the silver story because uh, they're, they're now learning how to replace platinum in fuel cells with much cheaper silver. Mm. And if that happens, and then fuel cells become the, uh, you know, the battery of the, the next decade, uh, then silver has another thing <laughs> that, uh, that it's going to go into that they're going to need millions of ounces of and everything. So I, I think what's happening in the uh, battery metals market right now is scary for those metals uh, and very possibly long-term interesting for silver what other co commodities look like they have a bright future copper is looking really good um although its short-term future is not as good as its longer-term future just because it's very cyclical you know and, and uh, if we have that recession at some point here that won't be good for for copper but uh, you know we need about twice as much copper as now comes out of uh, the currently functioning copper mines to um, to make good on all the plans that we have for electrifying the world, uh, but it's it's conceivable that we aren't even going to increase copper output over the next decade because like like we talked about, a lot of countries are just not into copper mining anymore or mining in general, and you know a lot of big mines are uh, are going to suffer in from various geopolitical issues or operating issues you know it's harder to operate a mine than it used to be just in general because um it, it's a it's very inflationary the uh, the labor input and the energy input uh into a typical mine is uh, is up in ways that are squeezing margins so anyhow copper looks fantastic towards the end of this but might have a kind of a couple of tough years but once it gets going and people realize there's just not enough copper the price has to go way up and uranium is a pretty much a, a perfect story you know uh, it, it doesn't have any of this intermediate term long-term stuff it's uh, we're already um, bringing more nuclear plants online than there is um, uranium to run them and the two biggest uranium miners Kazataprom and Cameco uh, just announced that they were having um, some technical issues that were going to limit how much they can mine and that were not going to go away right away. So, they're, you know, they're apparently um, multi-year issues. Um, and so that means that the supply of uranium is not going to be as robust as people expected it to be. At the same time that all these nuclear plants are coming online and um Uranium is a relatively small part of the cost equation for a nuclear plant. It costs a you know, huge amount of money to build the thing. And then when the fuel really doesn't add that much to the overall cost of you know, when you include financing and everything. So uranium can get more expensive without causing a, uh, a big pullback in demand. And that's liable to happen going forward. So I think the next few years, boring a war or something like that, or another Fukushima meltdown. So there are risks out there. But uh, barring these, these big black swan risks, the business case for uranium is phenomenal. And uh, I think everybody should own some of the miners or the, um, the service companies in that space. What do you think it'll take to get the junior mining stocks moving? Boy, uh, I don't know. Um, there, there are some really successful exploration companies out there that I'm watching and that I own stock in. Um, they're, they're finding, you know, tons of gold or silver or whatever. And, and, um, they, they, they have a clear path to becoming a productive miner and everything. And nobody seems to care. You know, the, their stocks just aren't going up in line with their uh, exploration success. Um, I, that's going to change, but what the catalyst will be isn't super clear. I mean, the, the thing I would not like to see, and this, this is probably the highest probability catalyst, is some big miners coming in and buying up some of the high quality um, juniors and explorers at nice premiums, you know, 50% premium, let's say, something like that. Uh, and that igniting the rest of the industry, everybody starts looking around for what is next. But see, then that means the, I'm buying the highest quality exploration companies, for instance. And that means that these things that should be 10 baggers will be bought out 
at 50% premiums, which does me no good at all. You know, so I, I don't want to see that. I want uh, something else to happen to get everybody excited and turn the best quality um, little miners into 10 baggers. And that might require a big run in gold and silver. So it could be that the underlying metals have to take off before the junior miners really get going. But once they get going, they'll, they will totally outpace gold and silver in per percentage terms. You know, silver will out outpace gold and the gold and silver miners will outpace silver. But we just need something to really get it going. So I think $40 silver would do it. And I think $2,500 gold would do it. So we're not all that far. You know, we were like three good months away from uh, of the kind of price levels that really light a fire under the junior miners. So it could happen sooner rather than later. And I just hope it hope it happens that way. Looking at New York, Toronto, Pittsburgh, Portland, San Francisco and a number of other big cities are Canada and the U.S. becoming third world countries, possibly by design. Well, we, we certainly are becoming third world countries. You know, the, the stuff we're doing um you know, it's hard to imagine that someplace like California would make shoplifting legal without knowing what the consequence would be, right? So, yeah, maybe it's by design because nobody is stupid enough to do these things and hope that they work. But here, you know, in the U.S., we've got um, several states. Let, let's make it 10 states, okay, because there's a lot of states making really horrendously stupid mistakes that are doing things like that. You know, and so they're just imploding. And at the same time, we've got the federal government just basically opening the southern border. We've had 10 million illegal immigrants cross the border and then just disappear into the country. Many of those people, okay, a lot of them were unaccompanied children who are going into uh, child slavery. And um, another large group of those illegals are military age men from countries that uh, don't really have compatible cultures <laughs> with us. So, um, you know, we're creating the conditions for just nightmarish stuff to happen. And then, then we had the kind of defund police thing that, that got going here. And, and a lot of police forces in big Democrat run cities are just um, hamstrung. You know, they can't do the jobs like Pittsburgh now in the U.S., if you um, if you call the cops, they, they won't even respond unless it's a crime in progress. If you're reporting something that's already happened, they give you a voicemail thing. You leave a message and they come out eventually. And then uh, um, New Orleans, I, I don't think I have the numbers quite right with New Orleans, so I'm going to approximate uh, the, the numbers. But it used to be that it took 35 minutes for the police to come when uh, – when you called, now it's 135 minutes. You know, you, you could be dead 15 times over if the cops don't show up for two hours, right? Uh, and that's the kind of world that we're creating here. So we've got mass migration in the U.S. going from these, these incredibly badly run states that are rapidly descending into third world style chaos. We've got people moving out of them and going to the, the more traditional states where, um, where if you commit a crime, they actually come and get you and they put you in jail, you know, stuff like that, old fashioned things like that. Um, so we're, we're seeing this huge um, shift in population. And um, what's happening, what's happening is the, uh, the, you know, the relatively sensible people from, say, California are moving to Texas and Florida and they're being replaced by illegal immigrants in California, who, uh, who who knows what they think or what they want or what they're going to do. You know, there's just no way to know. So California gets worse before it gets better. And I don't really don't see how it gets better, you know, unless they uh, they elect somebody that they'll never elect. Like if they elected a, a Ronald Reagan or um, or somebody like that, who's going to come in and um, and be all about lifestyle crimes and uh, and clearing out the streets and things like that. And they will never do that, though, because they're 70 percent um, extremely liberal. So I don't think California survives in its current form. You know, I, there, there's no way to imagine it being an actual viable state 10 years from now. Same thing with Illinois, possibly the same thing with New York. Um, several other states are in the same boat. So, yeah, I uh, and then um so I've been told, I haven't been to Canada for a while, but I've been told some of these same societal pathologies are, are starting to crop up in Vancouver and Toronto. And, uh, you know, here's hoping that you guys avoid that part of the process and we get our act together before you get sucked into it. But I really don't know. 
In Canada, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is raising the carbon tax by 23% on April 1st, and it's not an April Fool's joke. Is this a recipe for higher inflation followed by higher interest rates designed to knock down that high inflation caused by the government? Well, you know, energy is such a big part of everybody's life and of a business's business plan that if you raise the carbon tax by, you know, almost a fourth, then you're going to get probably three or four extra percentage points of inflation, right? Just by, by doing the math um, for how important energy is to life in general and to inflation in particular. So, yeah, I think you guys will have higher inflation. Um, and um, it, it's possible that, it, okay, un, under classical economics, if you raise the price of something, then people can't buy as much other stuff if they have to buy that expensive thing. And so sales drop and you get deflation in other se- sectors um, to offset the inflation in the first sector. But Canada can't let that happen. They can't let a lot of people drop into a deflationary spiral. So they will have to prevent deflation by creating a whole lot of new currency to offset the higher carbon tax. And that's going to be very inflationary, you know, because the, the car- energy will go up. And then the other things that the government cannot let decline in price will also go up and you'll just get that much more inflation. So this is the kind of thing that, um, that, you know, pushes an already indebted society off a financial cliff. And that's what I think we're doing here. You know, the U.S. is making, we're making our mistakes. You're making your mistakes, but they're all pushing us in the same direction. You know, we're going to, we're going to jump off that same cliff at some point in the not too distant future. John, where's the best place for people to follow you? I'm at rubino.substack.com and um, I publish a newsletter there that covers a lot of the things we talked about. And, uh, hopefully provides actionable advice on how to deal with it all. John, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Sure thing, Jim. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> My guest has been John Rubino, I've... author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble. He founded the website dollarcollapse.com, and as you heard, the best place to find him is on Substack at rubino.substack.com. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Eric Haddock and John Rubino and thank you for listening if you have any questions for the show or for our guests you can send them to info at housestreet.com I'm Jim Goddard we'll be back next week with more This Week in Money comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen.